This is War Room Moments, the show that takes you around the world to share interviews with some of the most successful and most relevant people on the planet, hear their stories, and get the most important business lessons they have learned on their road to success, and get exclusive advice on how to implement their success into your life and business. War Room Moments is brought to you by the Strategic Advisor Board. Here's your host, Jason Miller. Well, hey, welcome to the War Room today. Uh, Chris, it's great to have you here on the show today, buddy. Uh, Thanks, brother. Uh, welcome Thanks, on this kind of chilly and frosty day in Colorado and seems the same up there in your neck of the woods. Yes, it's that time of year. <laughs> yeah. So-called spring. Yeah, fake spring. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Well, well, hey, I always like to kind of kick off the show with uh, a little bit of an introduction. I'm horrible at doing it, so I'll let you just give a 30-second introduction of who you are and what your superpower is, brother. Sure, I appreciate it. I love that you're honest about it. You just like, I suck yeah. at that. You know? So it, <laughs> I know what I'm good thing, at. So, uh, there you go. <laughs> um, so uh, my name is Chris Hawk. Um, I am the founder or co-founder and CEO of Starstake, which is my company and technology company. Um, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a dreamer. I'm a misfit, right? Uh, I'm the guy that never should have been an entrepreneur. You know, it's uh, I've been down so many paths in my life. I've take, taken the road less traveled in many ways, which probably get into in this call, but um Really, uh, my passion is just creating things. I'm a creator, uh, just deep in my bones, um, from products to just even creating things. You know, with my family, it's just it's just embedded in me. So, my superpower is my creative thinking. It is the ability to look at things differently. I would say it's a blessing and a curse. I guess superpowers are that, right? Um, but uh, is that I can see, and I think I'm pretty good at seeing things a little bit differently that allow me to say, hey, maybe what if we built that? Or what if we did that? Or what if they did that? Um, it's just perspective. And um, I think that's probably other than my work ethic, which, you know, I don't want to, you know, I'm, I'm sure we all could say that, but um, yeah, it's the vision for sure. Yeah. And that's a, I, cause I kind of consider myself, I'm pretty much the same way, like strategically brained, I guess. And it is a curse and a blessing because your brain never shuts off. It's always yes. going all the time. It's, yes. it's like a computer just processing, processing mm -hmm. all the time. So it is a curse and a blessing. And I can, I can respect that for sure. <laughs> so. Yeah. My wife's like, Hey, you listening to me? I'm like, I know, but I'm sorry. Can you say that again? <laughs> like I can't trick her. She knows. Yeah. You know? Right. So. And if you, if you do say, or they know you're lying, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. He knows me too well. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, so does mine. <laughs> yeah, for sure. That's, that's good though. It is. Somebody's got to know you well enough to call your bullshit, right? <laughs> well, look, if you're an entrepreneur and you go down this road, it is not a easy road or a light road. And mm -hmm. so you have to have, they need to understand where your head is at. Otherwise it never works, you know? Yeah, that's true. No yep. doubt about it. Well, yeah, um, I kind of like to kick the show off and ask the question of, did you come from a family of entrepreneurs or professionals? What was that like for you growing up, I guess? So I grew up with like, you know, I mean, look, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm going on like 20 years or some 19 and a half mm. years of owning businesses, had some wildly successful businesses. Uh, my last company, we did over 220 million in sales. It was such a great success, amazing journey. Had some major bombs, of course. But <laughs> as a kid, like I guess you could say it. My dad, my family owned restaurants. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, my step family is Thai. So I grew up with Thai culture in my life. And um, so they owned a chain of Thai restaurants, sushi restaurants before that was even a thing. So I, I guess you could say they were entrepreneurial. Um, my dad worked like three jobs. He worked for the airline for 30 years, um, which didn't pay much back then, but it allowed us to travel for free. And then, in, and then he would work overnights and then, you know, he managed these restaurants. So, yeah, I mean, I grew up in the restaurant business as seeing mm -hmm. from an owner side, right? Like somebody doesn't show up, you go in, you know, something breaks down, you fix it. Like I saw that side of business early because I was always there with my dad. I was side by side. Mm -hmm. He was fixing you know, air ducts to, you know, whatever plumbing, you know, he was always fixing something. And I think 
a lot of his problem solving kind of bled into me in a way like he always found a way to fix something like if there was a problem he fixed it otherwise it didn't get fixed right so i definitely see that quality in myself um but i also saw the ugly you know and and mm. and you know it was funny when i got older after high school they asked me hey chris do you want to take over the restaurant business and i said no like i just really honestly i didn't want that obligation i didn't because i saw the turmoil that it caused in my family the fighting um yeah. between parents you know of like you look it's it's your kid your restaurant your business is it's like your child and i saw the the conflict that came from that and i never wanted that but lo and behold did i end up you know i ended up being an entrepreneur later on in life and but yeah i guess you could say there was that entrepreneurial spirit in my family but it was only mm -hmm. from one side it wasn't like you know coming from a legacy of like steve jobs or something like that it was just you know, they were hardworking, middle class, um, you know, middle of America um, workers. And I, I think that kind of gave me the bug early without me even knowing it. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's a tough business. I mean, the restaurant oh. business in itself, that's a that's a rough business. I mean, margins are thin. I don't think most people when they go into a restaurant and eat understand why a meal is 26 bucks, right? or or whatever the case why prices right. went up so crazy during covid or mm -hmm. or any of that stuff because the margins were already razor thin already so right. it is um, tough there's a lot of moving parts a lot of personalities mm -hmm. to manage i think that was probably one of the hardest things is seeing my parents manage the chefs right and chefs are, are like coders like in my world like they're <laughs> they're the creatives right yeah, and they want to cook yeah. how they're going to cook and they want to have the freedom to do it they don't want to be told what to do you know and so you have these personalities in the kitchen that cause you know you have a boss but at the same time they are the boss in a way and so um yeah it's just i think managing people what people don't understand like staffing and and especially in that business, you know, you were talking like Thai, like not everybody knows how to cook that food. It's very difficult. It's very ethnic mm -hmm. and, and specialized. So, you know, you don't have a lot of options to get help, you know? Yeah. So it's, yeah. you know, it's let's, <laughs> I learned how to cook very early on in life. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I bet you did. So is a, do you cook a lot of Thai food Never. now? Never? Never. No. <laughs> I don't have the time, brother. I just don't. My wife's like, can you make this? I'm like, no, can we go out? Like, can we just go to a Thai restaurant? You know, and like, That's it's just, it's hard. You know, it's yeah. time's time, but yeah. Yeah. That, that was a really interesting uh, little comparison you just made, though, between chefs and coders. <laughs> it's the same, bro. It's like, it's two of the same. Like, artists are artists. Yeah. Right. True. And, and, you know, if you're passionate about your craft, you're always going to have that balancing, especially as a CEO or as a founder, like you have to manage these people and you got to be compassionate about their passions and you have to lead them to get the best out of them when their best is required. So when you're busy and things are crazy, I mean, you see the reality shows nowadays, sure. people kind of see that in the kitchen, how stressful it can be and how mm -hmm. it can go south and sideways super quick. Um and look, you don't get a lot of chances in that business. If somebody gets bad food or you get somebody sick, you get shut down, you get licenses taken away, or people mm -hmm. just start, especially with the internet, man, like that word spreads fast. Yeah, you no know? doubt. Yeah. I, uh, one of my directors in my, in the strategic advisor board, he, uh, he launched about 30 some restaurants in his day. He launched uh smash burger. Mm. Um, the, CEO of Smashburger used to work for him and mm -hmm. and you even take one of them kind of chains and he said it's just yeah. that's why he looks at all of our clients PLs because he's yeah. just so good at it right mm -hmm. i mean he he will just give you a lobotomy of <laughs> a PL i mean he'll mm -hmm. break down every penny and you know, tell you exactly where you can shave margin, all this kind of stuff. So that's just a rough, that's a rough place to be. And I think that's why, you know, I mean, I've never owned restaurants. I've owned a couple dozen companies, but none of them have ever been in the restaurant business, but, and I, and, and they all have their challenges, right? It's like the tech space, the tech space is how it's got his own oh, challenges too. I mean, absolutely. You know, just trying to stay with 
forget ahead, right. just trying to stay with it. I can't even yeah. imagine. I mean, the probabilities of success in the tech space are very low because yeah. of the nature of technology, the cost of technology to build it and what's required mm-hmm. that the different pieces now, especially you get into web three, like what we're doing, you know, you have these kind of new frontier of web three and technology. And so you're pioneering a lot of the time. It's, you know, I always say to our team, like, you know, Elon, we're lucky we're not Elon Musk because we don't need a pass ratio of a hundred percent. You know, we're not there blowing up rockets. You know, right. we can test things. We can find the bugs before we have to launch anything. Um, so it's always in perspective, but it is so hard because look, like in our case, we're trying to build a new rocket from scratch, you know, mm-hmm. and you just have to go through the trials of that and and figure it out and yeah. solve problems. Yeah. You know? I don't think a lot of pe- business owners understand what web three is. Could you like maybe just do a little tiny bit of education on what <laughs> web three is? The, the shortest uh, version you possibly sure. can. <laughs> uh, I'm like the idiot when it comes to this stuff. I've got really super smart engineers around me. And um, I'm always like, hey, let's build you know our version of an iPhone in our space and, and try sure. to package things creatively. But you know, Web3 is just, to me, it's it's it offers solutions to problems we've had for a long time. Mm. And it allows us to build deeper ecosystems between ourselves, meaning like you have creator and companies and brands, and then you have fans and consumers, right? Mm-hmm. It allows us to connect in new ways. That's really how I would look at it. Like web two is all about publishing, right? It's about putting out your voice, interacting socially, whether that be social media or all the publishing platforms, blogs, and so forth. Mm-hmm. YouTube is a prime example. That's very web two. Uh, web three, however, starts to to now bridge us into this interaction where now it's not just your audience watching you, it's your audience participating with you. They're like becoming part mm. of that channel, right? Because look, I mean, if you look at it now, every YouTube channel, that's anything, they'll say, hey, make sure you like and subscribe and follow and hit that silly bell, do the dishes, give me your liver, whatever, right? It's <laughs> like they're, they're, they're doing everything they can. To connect yeah. with their audience, but they're very limited just be based on technology. And also because these platforms own you, I mean, let's face it, like they control everything and that's just their mm-hmm. business model. Like that's the space, like power to them. That's, that's where they came from. That's where they went. But as creators now who have the power, as far as the content and the attention right now, it's like, okay, where does web three create opportunities for the people that are the stars? Right. These YouTubers with millions of views bigger than TV networks, Mm -hmm. they don't control those networks. YouTube shuts them off. They lose their community immediately. Mm -hmm. Right. And it causes some serious problems because now, you know, we just did some some studies and we've we are finding so many creators getting burnout. And it's because they they really do their best to create this amazing production value in society and, and whether that be their content or product, business, whatever. But now they, they're not being seen. Like the algorithms are shutting down their views. So they're like literally mm. people with millions of subscribers are getting like 30,000 views, which that it's ridiculous. So like they do all this hard work and they can't even get their message out anymore. And of course that affects how they monetize their thing, their craft. Um, so there's like these serious problems there. And Web3 solves that in a way that it allows people to connect deeper. So now as a creator, you can own your community. So now you can actually own it. So if an advertiser wants to access your fans or your customers, they pay you, not a Mm. platform. And then you get 2% or 10%. Okay. So that ownership piece now is available. And it's the ability for creators or brands or companies to build an entire economy not just like, hey, here's a product on my Shopify store and I'm going <laughs> to offer you this, like literally from your own currency to your own access to your own loyalty clubs, like all these things now. And now your fans or customers can have a piece or a stake in you. And just think about that, right? Like our biggest threat, you, me, all us watching this, like business owners, it's disruption, Mm-hmm. Our biggest threat is disruption, right? Like we don't own our communities out there in social media and anybody can come in there if they're the highest bidder and get access to them, right? So we're always fighting to keep our customers. There's always going to be something better, cheaper, faster, you know, sexier yeah. than what we do. So we always have to like fight that. And I think we've kind of grown in web two to like, hey, the goal is to buy customers or you know, go out there and whoever can pay the most will get the most customers through advertising. 
we shouldn't be trying to purchase or buy customers. We should try to buy loyalty. And to buy loyalty, you need to buy relationships, right? You need to spend mm. money to build relationships, not just to do more ads, to get more clicks, to try to get that next customer, because somebody's right behind you about to take that customer away from you, even though you got them. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a shift of saying, hey, the only thing you really own in this world and business are customers for life, as Dan Kennedy would say it. Yeah. yeah is yeah. loyalty. Yeah, that's true, though. When you think about, you know, a lot of pe people spend a ton of money, right, trying to acquire a client once, mm -hmm. but then they drop the ball right after that. They make them a client once and they don't make them a reoccurring client over and over and over again. That's a down. I mean, that's an uphill battle, right? It's to have never to win. Fight that. You can't yeah. win that. You'll and, never win. You know, I always go back to, you know, these kind of conversations. I always go back to my dad when I was a kid because uh, I grew up on a farm, right? And every year the seed guy would stop out, you know, and sit at the table and they'd have a cup of coffee and he knew everything about our football games and all that. He knew the family, the seed guy, right? So did the insurance guy. So did the chemical guy. So did all of them. They all knew when they sat down, they knew us as a family. And then there was never any question of loyalty from my dad. It was like, here's a check. See you next year, right? And and then the next year they knew all the stuff that happened that year, right? So it's like there's something to be said about, you know, heck, a lot of people nowadays, you know, they talk to they don't even know if they have kids or anything, right? It's like none of that. It's so impersonal. And I know I take a lot of time to like really get to know the people that we work with. I mean, you should do that, right? Because that's how you embed that loyalty. That's how when you ask for something in return, you get it. No questions asked, right? And be a giver. Give, 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 right? And I've always been that way um, because one of my golden rules is give value for as long as it takes. You know? Yeah, I mean, that's that's always like a cornerstone you could never loyalty doesn't come from a series of transactions or mm -hmm. social posts it, it only comes from the relationship and the relationship yeah. has to come from feeling like you yeah. and i have a connection right like we have something in common or we have interests that align our values or and in the day and age of how many clicks and what can my roi and my cost per conversion or my lifetime <laughs> values like all these metrics that we look at but we're not measuring loyalty we're not measuring the relationship or putting value on it anyway. Okay. We, maybe we're assuming because if you look at loyalty programs, I mean, look, we go to Starbucks, they have a loyalty program. You buy so many coffees, you get points or something and you get more coffee. Right. There's no relationship with that. That's not loyalty or how many Subway sandwiches you buy and you get a free one. They call that a loyalty, but that's not loyalty because you could have the same sub shop that's doing the same thing next to you, you mm -hmm. know? you have to create feelings. And that's what there's certain companies, uh, a colleague of mine, Russell Brunson, who owns ClickFunnels, he did it very, very right. You know, he built the technology that nobody knew about. Nobody knew what a funnel was. It, everybody had these websites they paid a fortune for. And, you know, he went out there and created a culture of people to say, hey, I want to show you how you can get sales from your website, not just have a pretty website. And, yeah. you know, he kind of bent the norm but he created a culture of people to the point where people would never even go and use any other service, just like your, you know, your dad and your, your farm. There mm -hmm. was a relationship ship he had with people, and he yeah. established that first before he even even asked for the sale. And you know, it's I think that is the future. That's where we need to be is going. Mm -hmm. I would say back, but forward again to building relationships. There's no reason why we can't. Um, it's just a matter of being creative and as creators and entrepreneurs creating solutions for that yeah i call it going beyond the vanity metrics there you go yeah absolutely because that's all that is uh you know when somebody says oh i got ten thousand views on my post who cares <laughs> who gives a shit <laughs> right how many likes you got or 
any of that. It don't matter. Hell, half that stuff, it's just VAs in the background just liking and doing stuff, right? So it's like, it's all bullshit, right? I mean, the thing you can't replace is this right here, right? And, or like yesterday, I got to go up with one of our clients in Denver and I got to go to a board meeting uh, with him and one of the clients and his client. Uh, and those are like the things you can never, right. that's like, you're like forging the relationship deeper. Right. And his kids right. were with job shadowing and all this stuff. And it's just, that's the cool stuff. And then I right. got to, you know, buy him a, a shake afterwards and sit in the burger shop and BS with the kids. And, you know, they're just young kids. Yeah. And, but those kids will remember that forever. Right. And that's relationship building, community building. I'm a huge community builder and I love building communities because, yeah. you know, that's where, you know, we truly get somewhere. And if you, if you don't make everything so damn transactional all the time, you'll find you'll get a lot, you'll get there a lot faster. Right that will just kind of naturally happen. And, you know, people hear that and they're like, yeah, right. That's bullshit. But, but there's a lot of truth in it, you know, yeah. it's still hard. It's not easy, but, yeah. but it's, it's doable for sure. Um, but anyway, let, let's revert back just a touch to you coming up through business and, you know, how did you find yourself, you know, getting here? to to the space oh, you're in God. now how did i get here i <laughs> couldn't say you know it's funny after high school man it you know i was like not the college kid i didn't want to go to college mm -hmm. so i actually moved to asia and i was a kickboxer professionally i was doing muay thai before like the ufc is was is what it is and so i was training because i just wanted to be like I was, I grew up with Schwarzenegger and Van Damme and mm -hmm. all those guys, like those were my idols, you know? And so I was like, I'm going to go live the rough life, the fighter life. And so I did that and uh, lived in Thailand for several years. I, and, and then I was like, oh man, this is going to be tough when I'm 50. Like, how do I do this? And there was no money in it back then. There was no like, I'm going to win a title or something. And mm -hmm. so I ended up moving back to the States and studying law at the University of Minnesota. I wanted to be an investigator in the FBI. So I studied that and 9-11 um, hit and I got a job offer from Homeland Security my junior year in college. So I dropped out temporarily from that and I took the job. And, um, you know, look, I mean, I was like, I was like super gung-ho on government, government. And, and then I realized that that just was not my game. Like I respect it in a way, but it just wasn't for me. Um, and that's where I was like, man, if I'm working this hard, you know, I need to be around more successful people. So I moved to Florida to Boca, uh, Raton, Florida and, and became a financial guy. And I was like, if I'm just going to work with other people that know how to make money and maybe I'll figure it out, I'll learn something. Mm -hmm. And so I did that and absolutely hated it. Like that whole industry, the finance industry was just not, I didn't like the, the, the man I was becoming. Mm -hmm. Um, if you know the stock world and commodity world, you know what I'm talking about? It was just very ugly. Mm -hmm. But it gave me sales skills. Like I look back and like, thank goodness I did that because it gave me the thick skin for sales and, you know, uh, so right. forth. So at that point I was like schlepping and, and I was making good money, but I was like, if I'm going to work this hard, I might as well work for myself. And that's how I kind of got into the entrepreneur. Cause remember I was like fighting against it because I didn't want the restaurant business. And I associated mm -hmm. being a business owner with restaurant drama and, and problems. So I avoided it until I was like, man, I could be pretty good at it. And I just happened, man, to, to get lucky in a way, right time, right place. I got into Google early when it was like, kind of like printing money. And mm -hmm. so I, I struck, I just really striked really hard on that and um, made a bunch of cash and then started to develop software to help other companies. And that kind of turned into like, Chris, how'd you do that? How did we do that? And so I just started speaking all around the country of, of this and um, found a passion in that and started doing big, big events and stadiums and stuff. It was wild. And um, then kind of took a hiatus back and said, yeah, I want to, truthfully, I'll say it on, on this podcast, like, I just wanted to feel like uh, Tony Stark. Like, I wanted <laughs> to build cool stuff. I want to build cool shit. Like, I just, mm -hmm. you know, I wanted to, I was so deep into the whole entrepreneurial thing. I just wanted to build cool product. 
I didn't even care if I failed. Like it was to that point. Like I didn't even think I was going to be successful. I just wanted to build cool stuff and wake up in the morning and feel like really excited about that and just see where it went. I figured I was, if I was good enough, I could figure it out. And so mm-hmm. I went down that road, raised a bunch of cash for one company, uh, into the, uh, augmented reality space VR stuff early on. And um, it was super hard. Uh, raising money is not my favorite thing to do, but I kind of knew that world. Um, and then it just so happened. I just, I was out in the Philippines working for a company and consulting them and I met the right people and engineers and we put our heads together and said, let's do this thing. And that's how we started Star Stake and actually met my wife in the Philippines. And it's kind of been history after that, man. So yeah, it's crazy. Wow. That's the story. You know, it's amazing listening to, you know, a compressed timeline from somebody, right? <laughs> yeah, that's not, yeah, it's hard. It's yeah. hard. Oh yeah, right? it is. Yeah, a and there there was a lot of lot of arrows in the middle of all that too, right? <laughs> oh man, you know, it's I didn't mention it. when I was in high school, I wanted to be a SEAL, and I know you have like military audience here, so I, I should mm-hmm. mention this. I actually wanted to be a Navy SEAL. I was a state swimmer in school. So I was like, oh, I can, you know, be a SEAL. So my dad and I, my dad's super cool like this. Um, he's like, oh, we'll go out to Coron- Coronado in California. I'll bring you to Bud's and we'll go like look at the SEAL so I could talk to them. And like, this was before 9-11. So we like mm. snuck into Bud, like literally like two civilians, like two idiots snuck <laughs> into Bud's because the, the, the lady that owned the convenience shop outside of there, like was from Minnesota. So my dad like sweet talked her to let us in. So we go in there and, you know, I'm, we're seeing people go through Bud's training and, and here I'm 16, 17 years old and uh, sat down with, I think it was the master chief at the time. And he's like, sure, you sure, son, you want to do this? And I'm looking out the window. These guys just getting drilled, man, like just <laughs> drilled. And I'm like shaking, you know, and, and my dad's looking at me, son, you sure you want to do that? <laughs> you know, and I was like, yes, I will train for a year. I, that is my, my dream. And uh, ended up not doing, I ended up going to Thailand and, and kickboxing. But funny thing is when I got there, I ended up training with a SEAL team that was stationed in Pattaya, mm. Thailand. So it was really cool. I got to kind of be part of that culture without being in it um, and hear their stories a bit. And, you know, it was pretty cool, man. So it's funny yeah. how that works. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I spent 23 years in and I always tell people that service comes in a lot of ways, right? And a lot of ways. And we all serve in some form or fashion, no matter what. So, and yeah. So, uh, you know, Navy SEAL, not Navy SEAL. We we all have our own way of giving back to our communities or our country or whatever it is. So, you know, I always tell entrepreneurs, thank you for your service because, man, right. it's just as freaking important, right? If we didn't have entrepreneurs and business owners, right, where yeah. where where would we be today? It'd be a pretty different looking world, right? Be pretty boring world. Be pretty right? boring, be still right? Drawing on cave walls, if that were the case. Yeah, probably. We probably yeah. would be. It'd be a bunch of monkeys. <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. For sure. Well, well, hey, uh, I mean, we really got pretty deep there and and kind of shot over time here, but uh but for those people that uh you know just didn't there was a lot of lessons in what we just talked about, but but let let's give the thump in the head here. And like if you had like two go-to things that you would love a f- new founder or even a you know older business owner to know. Um, what'd be a couple of key pieces of advice you'd give? Um, I think self-confidence is everything mm. because it's, it's going to get ugly. Yeah. It's going to get deep. It's going to get muddy. It's going to get hard. It's going to push you beyond anything you've ever done before. And I, I only say that because I, I mean, I've lost everything in my life a few times and you just got to have that unwavering confidence in yourself to pick yourself up and say you're good enough. And Mm -hmm. that's the challenge that I dealt with was like, oh, maybe I'm not good enough to do this. Maybe I'm not good enough to make this work out. And for your family, for your wife, for your kids, for your friend, like for you, you have to have that undying belief that you are good enough. Otherwise you have no business in this, in this business. Like you just, that is a skill that self-talk that 
overcoming people saying, hey, you know, you should, you're still doing that internet thing. I used to get asked that all the time. You're still doing that internet thing. You're right. Like people put doubts in your head or now you have the, unfortunately, it's social media that will put doubts in your head or you'll compare yourself sometimes to others that are successful. And for some reason, we've kind of glorified entrepreneurship in a way, right? It's mm-hmm. sexy. It's cool to be an entrepreneur, but what they don't see is the tough stuff, right? Like the depression and the hardship and the losing things and the risking everything because mm-hmm. you have to, you have to risk failure, but you have to have first and foremost for everyone else around you, the belief that you can do it. That would be the first thing because without that you're, yeah. you're crushed um, people, everything will crush you. Second is never to be overly, this is a lesson I learned is never be overly rom- romantic about an idea or a concept or a business uh, product, right? Sometimes we get hung up on wishful thinking. I know I heard that from Elon in a while back is, you know, that's one of the biggest mistakes you can make is it be wishful thinking like, oh, it's just going to work out. It'll all work out. Well, look, if the probabilities aren't there, if the math doesn't check out, like you got to learn to cut it, right? Like Mm -hmm. if it's just not working, cut it loose. Don't be so overly romantic about ideas to where it brings you down in a sinking ship you know, pivot, do whatever you have to do to make the adjustments and be okay with it. Like, don't have the ego and be like, I have to be right. Otherwise I'm worthless. No, Mm -hmm. be wrong and be better. It's just a much healthier, more successful way to live. Um, That's what I would say. You're never going to avoid the arrows, man. Like you're going to take them and you have to just have the armor to be able to take them, brush them off and say, next, give me your best shot. I'm here. I'm ready to take it. And the probabilities of you being successful are much higher, I think, with that mentality. Yeah. And hopefully, once you know better, you do better. <laughs> That's right. Learn. Yeah. Yeah. Actually learn yeah. from it. I mean, I know yeah. a lot of people that they just make the same mistakes over and over and just beat their head up against the wall. Right. And why do you think you that know, is? I don't know. Jason. I, I I think it's just people get so married to they get married to their, their stuff and they're just, they'll just keep going and going and going. I mean, how many times I know shark tanks bullshit, but, but, but how many times on there, uh, you know, I've, I've watched several shark tank episodes. People are so married to their stuff. They'll get on there and they're like requesting $10 million and they've only made one sale, right? I mean, it's just like, holy shit, man. (laughs) And some of it's for TV. I get it. But there's people like that, though, that they're so married to their stuff that they'll marry it all the way to failure. And there's never a divorce. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. you got to learn to divorce your own shit sometimes and just. Put it in the dumpster and light it on fire, right? Yeah, and I think that comes with good counsel, right? Like Mm -hmm. sometimes you can't make those decisions yourself. Look, we're human. There's no safeguards for that. Sometimes we just got to have somebody around us, and it's our job to put those people around Mm -hmm. us to be able to tell us the truth. Like we don't all have a shark tank for them (laughs) to tell us and call our BS, Right. right. But we need it. Like I need it. I need my executives to tell me like, Chris, this is not a good idea. Like that's not, that's not a good idea financially, whatever the case, like I trust them. My mm-hmm. number two is my most valuable asset in my company. It's I value them. So I think sometimes we have to save ourselves from ourselves. Mm. Right. Yeah. Um, Cause we won't see it. Like, you know, we're, we're visionaries. It's we get blinders sometimes. Yeah. That's very true. Very, very yep. true. Well, well, hey, Chris, how, how do you want people to reach out to your company, if at all? Do you want them to come find you? How would you like people to connect? Um, look, you can just check us out. Uh, we're actually launching next month. Star Stake has been a, a two-year grind, a passion project. Uh, it's going on seven years of of kind of this vision of, of building what we're building. And so if you, if you want to check it out, um, star state, it's free. It will be free when it comes out, but you'll be able to see what we're doing. Um, we have a lot of articles we've been featured in, in Forbes and entrepreneur magazine and some of these other, uh, outlets, um, as far as what we're looking to do to help build loyalty and basically allow you to connect greater with your customers and fans to, 
protect against that disruption, right? Like to build mm-hmm. loyalty in ways that has a relationship, um, a financial connection, uh, things like that. So just take a look at us. You know, I mean, look, I'd love for you guys to watch our journey. I'm super excited to share it. Uh, obviously, but more so, you know, Star Stakes free. Anybody can use it if you're a brand or creator. So there's no cost uh, front for it. Um, and so we're just going to be asking and looking for new creators to kind of come with us and let us work with your use case and and help build, you know, a program around you um, to build deeper connections with your fans and customers. So, but uh, otherwise, we can reach out Chris Hawk at starstake.com. You can reach me by email. Um, I always love talking to, to entrepreneurs. So. Yeah. Awesome. Well, well, great. We'll kind of wrap wrapping this thing up. Here's the, the, the grand finale for the million dollar question. Right. And that is, you know, Chris, I mean, if you could have had anybody here today, any point in time, dead or alive, doesn't matter. Who would have you loved to have here with us to either listen in or maybe even, you know, chime in and, and why them. So dead or alive dead or alive right um i I think it's kind of a selfish thing more so than anything i think you know having someone like napoleon hill like that's how i got Mm -hmm. started as an entrepreneur i read you know think and grow rich but you know that was he was around before social media we never got to know the guy you know he's he's been kind of a cornerstone for me and, and i know a lot of people but i would love to just like if he was here i'd just shut up i would never even talk (laughs) <laughs> you know, because I would just cash in on the knowledge of somebody who never had social media or like podcasts, for example, to get their yeah. voice out. But somebody like that, you know, and just to shut up, like I said, and just listen and, and you know, you read all the books in the world, but like, who's the man behind the man? You always wonder that. Right. Yeah. So some of those be like, I hear about, you know, I hear videos, watch videos of Elon all day long and you hear all these cool stories of, you know, the Steve Jobs stuff, but some of the people that didn't get that opportunity, I would love to hear what makes them tick Mm -hmm. uh, in the past, you know? So, yeah, for sure. Yeah. That's a great answer. Great answer for sure. And there's not a wrong one anyway. Right. Um, But anyway, so man, Chris, what a great, you know, uh, there was a lot of, a lot of little gold nuggets in here along the way. And I hope people paid attention and, uh, you know, I always say we all have the same 168 hours a week. Thanks for stopping by for 43. Um, we mm-hmm. went blue over time a little bit, but that's what happens when you have a good conversation. So, um, and uh, yeah, thank you for your time and coming on the show. Thanks, brother. I appreciate it. Anything you need, just give me a holler. Always good to yeah, chat. Yeah, yeah. We, we need to do a after launch podcast. Yeah, wouldn't that be fun? Like a year from now, where you, mm. where you are now mm-hmm. <laughs> with the new company. So anyway, yes. awesome. Well, uh, yeah, best of luck. And Thank you. man, just the little bit I know you, I know you're going to go out and crush it for sure. Appreciate it, brother. All so right. Much. Cheers. Thanks, man. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to War Room Moments with your host, Jason Miller. Please leave your feedback and visit strategicadvisorboard.com to get the latest and greatest business advisement on the planet. Follow us on social media for updates, and we'll see you on the next episode.